Hi and welcome back. So right now we're going to talk about the boring stuff. We're going to talk about the course requirements. Uh, most of this you can actually find online on the Canvas course, but hey, uh, I think it's better to hear it in the original droning voice that I provide. So sit back and enjoy. First up, uh, I want you to know that this class has a required textbook, but for the first time this semester, the textbook is integrated into the course. So if you are registered for the course, you already had, as part of your payments, had to pay a $54 fee, and that grants you full access to the integrated text. The integrated text is located in the Canvas web page. So if you go to the Canvas course, you should be able to find it. And why don't we just go look at it right now? So if you go to your Canvas dashboard and you go over to the course and you click on the course and you scroll down, you'll see all the various things, the course introduction. At the bottom of the course introduction, you'll see Kleiner's Gardner's Art Through the Ages of Global History. Now this thing is called MindTap. MindTap is an integrated online feature for the textbook. But if you click on this link, this will open a page and this will force you to click on it again uh, because it's redundant that way. And if you click on it, it'll actually open up a separate page. And this page is the textbook. So you can see the basically the, the table of contents over here. Here are all of the chapters. So say, for example, you want to look at, so oh, let's just say Ancient Greece. Could click on Ancient Greece. There is the reading right there. So if you clicked on that, that'll pull up all the relevant readings. It takes a minute. Takes more than a minute. An eternity later. Here we go. Uh, so here you have the opening introduction. And if you go up to the chapter contents, it'll give you this list of, you know, the table of contents. So if we wanted to say, look at, oh, the Diplon Crater, uh, we could take a look at it here. And here is the reading. So this gives you the full textbook. It gives you a way that you can access it. You can access this textbook uh, in a separate page by going to this link here. But if you'll notice, say you go down, those readings are also right there integrated into the module itself. So this will take you directly to the chapter in question. So you can hunt and peck for it here, or you can read it at your leisure. One of the things I want to point out is there's a lot more resources here than just the reading. I'm mostly concerned about the readings, but there are also flashcards, quizzes, there's also videos to look at, uh, specific videos like the Classical Moment and Beyond. Uh, there's a whole series of YouTube videos that they link to uh, that are really good and very resourceful. So take advantage of that. Uh, those quizzes that you can take out on the uh, MindTap course are really for your own benefit and practice. They don't add to the, the class, but hey, you paid for them. You might as well take advantage of them. So everything you need is here. Okay. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so when we start talking about course requirements, uh, the course requirements are pretty simple. Right off the bat, you have two exams, a midterm and a final. The course is breaking down into two parts. The first part covers prehistoric up through classical art, and everything on that will be covered in the midterm. Then after that, we go from Roman art to medieval art, and all of that will be covered on the final exam. The final is non-comprehensive. It only covers everything from the second half of the course. There are also assignments. You have a paper project. Uh, you have, a, you have a, either a research paper or a research project that you can choose, and then you have to submit a proposal for that. And then there's just class citizenship and participation. Let's talk a little bit about the exams more in depth. So once you get through one of these sessions, you'll get down to a page that gives instructions for the midterm, and there'll be a study sheet and a review session. The study sheet has about 40 to 50 images. The exam is taken online. Uh, Canvas calls these things quizzes, but 
That's just the way Canvas works. They're actually exams. And there's actually a proctoring software known as Proctorio, uh, which sounds like the world's worst superhero name ever. Uh, certainly don't want to see that origin story. Uh, this basically monitors you as you're taking the exam. But the exam is open book, open notes. Usually when I give these exams in class, I force you to remember the artist title, date, period, medium, and location, but you don't have to do that for the online class. Uh, so what I am going to ask you to do is to dig a little deeper. The test is essay-based. That is that everything is going to be an essay response. You're going to input text. And I want you to concentrate on the major themes of the course. So you don't need to remember the identification information. I'll give that to you. Um, but you will have to write these pretty intensive essays. So the, the essays work in uh, three different ways. There's five short answer essays, there's two comparison contrast essay questions, and then there's three unknown essays. And I'm going to show you how these work. So I do have a sample exam in this test. So here's how the five short essays would work. I'll show you an image from the study list, and you'll have to answer this in something approximating 50 words. These are really short, so I'll show you something like, say, this image of Leon Cathedral, and I'll say, okay, using this as your example, identify and describe at least two unique features of the early French Gothic. So that would be something like, you could say, the Rose Window, the Westwork Towers, the Tracery, the Pointed Arches, there's a whole number of things, but I'm only asking you to do two. So there'll be five short answer questions like that. Those are pretty punchy, pretty specific. The comparison and contrast essay questions are far more involved. I'm going to show you two images side by side, and there'll be a longer question that will take some thought. So for example, I might show you two items such as this, comparing two buttressing systems from the Gothic period, and you would have to answer something like this. The answer would say, you know, explain the details of it, and remember that these questions have multiple parts, and so you're going to have to answer each part. These essay questions should be somewhere in the realm of 200 to 400 words a piece. And then finally, there's the unknowns. Now, the unknowns are a little different. The unknowns are going to assume that you haven't seen this either in class or in person, but it should look similar to some of something that you've seen in class, something off the study list. And so what I want you to do is to compare it to something off the study list. So if I saw, gave you something like this, um, this is actually the Staffordshire um, treasure, which is this treasure of Anglo-Saxon artifacts. You could compare it to, say, something like the Sutton Hoo ship burial, which is an item off of the study list, which has it's an Anglo-Saxon object. And you could list out the details of why you thought it was similar. What were the styles? What were the techniques? What were the themes that actually made you think it was created at the same time? So there's that's how the exams work. This will be taken entirely online uh, through Canvas. The exams are open for a week only. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half to take one of these exams. Uh, if you're writing it out by hand, it might take a little longer. You have two hours to take it, just to give you a little padding time. Uh, and you can take it any time during the week that it's scheduled. So you have a, a week. You can schedule it any one of those days during that week. So the midterm is going to be scheduled coming up in the middle of October. Uh, I think it's the 9th through the 16th. And then the final is scheduled at the end and finals week, which is the 11th and the 8th through the 18th of December. You can take the test anytime during that time. But once you start it, you are committed to having to finish it. And it takes about you know, an hour or so to take. You only have a two hour window once you start. If you have a, a letter from the accessibility office, an accommodation issue, that's fine. We can add more time to that if need be. Uh, so hopefully you can get those in and get those scheduled. It's nice to be a little flexible. Let's talk about the research papers and projects. So everybody must complete either a research paper or a research project, but not both. Okay, so you don't have to do a project and a paper. You have to do a project or a paper. So which one should you choose? Uh, it's up to you. I let anybody do whatever they want as far as either a paper or a project. But generally, I encourage if you're a studio major, probably the project, a creative project, is going to be the best option for you. Uh, if you are a student that's going into, say, art history, 
or something like uh, liberal arts or more of a research role, then you probably ought to do the research paper because that's more in line with what your discipline is. So let's talk about research papers first. <coughs> Excuse me. I did cough into my elbow, even though I'm all alone in this office. Uh, the term paper is a research paper on a single topic relating to material discussed in this class. So that means it has to be from Western art and it has to be from art from before the Renaissance. The suggested length of this is 8 to 12 pages double spaced, but really that's just a guideline. If it's 5 pages of double spaced brilliance, that's fantastic. If it's 20 pages of pure boiler, boilerplate BS, that's not fantastic. It's really how well you present the information. Now, the paper can either be a synthesis or a summation. What I mean by that is a synthesis is where you take several different ideas and come up with a new idea by crafting them together. A summation could just be, hey, here's what the state of the research on this particular topic is. You could also do new research if you wanted, but that's more of a graduate level idea. So choose a manageable topic. That's probably the first thing you got to do. Don't choose something too broad. Say if you pick something like Egyptian art or Greek art, well, good gravy, that's massive. That's textbook size. Choose something smaller, like say uh, images of the Book of Dead in Egyptian art in the New Kingdom. Say that's a very narrow topic, something you can narrow down. But if you narrow it down too far, you won't be able to find sources. So a good way of judging this is how many sources can you find? If you can right off the bat find five good, solid academic sources, uh, then that's probably a good sense that you're in the right space. If you can't, that means it's probably too narrow. You need to broaden it out a bit. So you must submit a paper proposal and an annotated bibliography uh, before beginning on the final paper. And that means that uh, you have to give me at least five academic sources and you have to give me annotations on them. Annotations are brief summations of where did you find this source <laughs> and what use of it is it going to be in your research paper. Uh, no general references, please. That means no Wikipedia encyclopedias or your textbooks. You cannot use your textbook, even your online textbook, as a source. Now, there is a full set of guidelines for how I want these proposals done. They're on Canvas, so go check those out. Uh, in research papers, I'm mostly looking for clear and concise composition, proper writing style. You know, do you have a thesis? Do you have a plan of procedure? Do you follow it? Um, do you back up your arguments with citations and references and logical arguments? You also have to conform to the Chicago Manual of Style. Uh, the Chicago Manual of Style is standard for art history. Uh, I know not many people use it anymore, other than art history and archaeology and a few others. Most people go on to MLA or APA, but those styles and parenthetical styles are unacceptable, and they will get you marked down significantly. So you must use footnotes and bibliography. Do not use works cited lists, and do not use parenthetical citation. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, people used to have a handle on, on citation styles, uh, but they don't anymore. But if you don't have a handle on it, don't worry. The guidelines have links to the Chicago Manual of Style uh, online manual, and so those will help you. Uh, all of the research papers are due on the last day of class. Uh, proposals are coming up right on September 25th. You can submit a rough draft if you want. Uh, but the rough draft is entirely optional. Moving on to the project option, a research project is very similar, except instead of making a paper, you make a project. You make an original creative work. Now, it's very important that this is not just something that's creative for the sake of being creative. This is not just a springboard for you to launch off into your creativity. This is something to prove to me that you researched this topic. And as such, a good research project, first and foremost, demonstrates your research, okay? And it does so in a sensitive way. What I mean by that is that you're not just treating these original cultures in a pastiche way. I'll give you some examples. Uh, a good idea of a project, something like a scale model, a reproduction of a historical work that explains a technique or a method, uh, a demonstration of a technique or method, or any original work that, you know, kind of incorporates or interprets the historical work in a creative way. Um, there are many, many ways that you could do this. 
So for example, this is a reproduction of a very famous Minoan fresco. And so this student made a reproduction. In the original, this is just very fragmentary broken pieces. So this is a way of showing what it might have looked at. There's a few of these reproductions that have existed, uh, you know, that in my classes, here's one that's an example of marineware. Here's a reproduction of the tomb of Nebamun. It's quite nice. Or you could do a re uh, an examination of a historical technique. In this case, the student wanted to explore the techniques of cave paintings. Those cave paintings, believe it or not, were actually blown onto the wall. They would actually put the paint in their mouth and spray it onto the wall, almost like an airbrush. So that's what he did here. And so you can see him using the technique. Here's a couple of other students doing something similar. Uh, this student wanted to reproduce uh, the mos pebble mosaic techniques from Pella in uh, Hellenistic Greece. This other student used embroidery to replicate the techniques of the Bayou tapestry. Scale models are a popular choice, but I always have to warn people about scale models, is that if you make a scale model, it must be a scale model. Scale means something. It means that there is a consistent proportion and scale to the entire thing. And what that means is, you know, if you have a foot on the original, it's going to be represented as like a quarter or an eighth of an inch on the model or whatever. Uh, and so make sure you're doing these to a consistent scale. Uh, make sure that they actually do represent the features on the site. Here's an example of an excellent scale model of uh, Stonehenge, for example. You have a consistent scale. Uh, there's a reduced detail. There's some decisions uh, that have been made, but in every way they tried to replicate the original. Here's an example of a bad scale model. Uh, this student, I have, you know, this is something that happens all the time, and I have no idea how students think this is acceptable. Uh, the student, if you look at this, it doesn't even have an accurate number of uh, stones. The stones are not laid out in an accurate way. Uh, they just put them on moss to make it look green. This is a student who is confusing the superficial qualities of the site uh, with the actual reality of the site. The purpose of a scale model is to give you another view of something, to give you a sense of how it might have looked, to give you this kind of bird's eye view into it. What insight does this give it to you? It's just garbage. Here's another example of a really bad scale model, an example of a failing project. Uh, this is a student that was trying to recreate this temple. And I don't even know how to explain this, how bad this really is. Um, People have this sense that, oh, if I have a, if I have columns and I have a pediment, oh, that's a model. This thing doesn't even have the same number of columns, for criminy's sake. I mean, good gravy. If you look at this, uh, the columns, I'm just grab a pen here. Uh, if you look at this, this thing has <laughs> six columns on one side. And of course, you can count the columns here that... There are a lot more columns than six. And notice that they're not equally spaced, unlike the original. Uh, this is very haphazard. This is ad hoc. There's no evidence that they took any kind of serious consideration of the original at all. That doesn't mean that these things have to be super ridiculously detailed. For example, this is a model that isn't especially detailed, but it's pretty accurate. This is a pretty accurate, adequate scale model of these tombs that existed in Meroe, uh, which was this location in Nubia where you have this late flourishing of Egyptian culture down in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this model, also not a bad model, uh, not very detailed, but pretty accurate to scale. The problem is, is this is the pyramid at Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza is a Mayan temple uh, from the terminal uh, classic Mayan period in Mexico, and that is definitely not part of Western art. So, uh, you know, please, people, uh, make sure you pick a topic that's from the right time period. Uh, here's another example that I, oh my gosh, I just, ugh, you know, poor execution. This is just incomplete, unprofessional. Please um, have some pride. Now, there's another thing that people do that's very common that gets them into trouble is that they don't treat the original cu culture in a serious way. I do allow my students to make original works of art. That is, you don't have to make a reproduction of a historical object. You could do something else. You could do an interpretation of a historical object. This means that you create a, a unique work of art. But if you do that, remember, 
The purpose is to prove to me that you did your research. So this was done by a student who did a stele. A stele is a uh, very famous kind of monument. It's an upright stone. You find it all over the ancient Near East. Egyptians did it. And so she did a stele, and she wanted to do a stele that was unique to her. But she decided to do it in a traditional Egyptian style. And even though this isn't very sophisticated, it's just done on pencil on paper, it does incorporate all these features to it. This is representative of her parents. This is her stylistically. Uh, they look very Egyptian. It uses Egyptian hieroglyphics correctly as well as iconography correctly. That is, it is, it's very respectful to the original culture and demonstrates she learned about the original culture. Here's another student who did something very similar, uh, but it's just terrible. Uh, the heads are overly large. Uh, it doesn't really resemble Egyptian style. Um, the iconography isn't Egyptian in any way. Uh, it's hard to see any Egyptian, you know, if you show this to an Egyptian, one of the ways I tell people to think about this is if you show this to somebody from that time period, would they recognize it? And instantly an Egyptian would recognize this as his cultural idiom, whereas no Egyptian would recognize this as a cultural idiom. It's not just about putting people in profile and, and putting them in registers. There's, there's more to it than that. Uh, here's another example. A student did this. Uh, did this as a kind of interpretation of the pyramid at Saqqara, the pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara. What can I say? Uh, it's not correct to scale. It, it doesn't really demonstrate that they learned anything about the original culture. The only thing that this object and the original have in common is that they have steps, and that's just not good enough. Uh, I always want to say that the biggest issue is that I have students who sometimes produce beautiful works of art that fail, and I have students that produce really hideously ugly stuff that wins, that get that get A's. It's not about the artistic merit. They're not judged on artistic merit. They are judged on how well you demonstrate your research. I had a student who did a beautiful um, picture. Uh, it was a painting of, a, of some kind of warrior on a pegasus and it was a beautiful oil painting. Absolutely loved it. Failed him. Uh, because their image of a pegasus and a Greek warrior was entirely culled from modern video games. You know, it was all stereotype and pastiche. And I've had other students who made things that, you know, really kind of failed, but they recorded their process and they demonstrated that, that they had learned something. That's what it's about. So if you do a research project, you must also submit a proposal in advance. Uh, again, you have to have at least five academic sources. Those have to be annotated. An annotation, again, is summation of what is this, what is the uh, basic contents of this source and how is it going to be used for your paper. You should look for resources in scholarly books and journals and online reputable sources. Uh, an online reputable source is not Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, you know, you can go to like something like Metropolitan Museum of Art. You want to look for uh, very reputable sources. Uh, please do not use general reference. Please do not use your textbook. And then when you're done with your project, you submit documentation of your project at the end of the semester. And with this, you must include a one to two page double space self-evaluation of your final project. Uh, there's guidelines for this. The self-evaluation is your opportunity to put your best foot forward on your project and demonstrate what you've learned. And to you know also give you a little fudge room, uh, students, I, I've discovered that you know, I ask an, a studio major to write a five-page paper and they're slitting their wrists. Uh, if I ask them to do a creative project, then suddenly they start taking on a scale model in actual skies of the Great Sphinx. Uh, they will do anything. They will pour themselves into creative projects like crazy, where they wouldn't want to write a paper. Uh, but then sometimes they bite off more than they can chew. Uh, the project is too big or something blows up in the kiln or something goes wrong. So the self-evaluation is a way to kind of, you know, fudge a little bit and say, hey, here's the challenges I've met, here I overcame them. Uh, no project travels in a straight line. And so this is a way to say, hey, this is the changes I had to make. So all uh, assignments are submitted online. Paperwork must be submitted online. Uh, we'll take Word doc formats or PDF. A PDF seems to work the best. Uh, so don't do things like Google Doc links. I can't use those. Don't use straight text. Make sure these are submitted as PDF documents. And late papers and projects will only be accepted with 
uh, for medical or severe personal and family emergencies, okay? So there are technical issues I recognize with working online. So sometimes things go down. So there is a 24 hour grace period for submitting things online. That is, as long as it's you know within that 24 hours of the deadline, and deadlines are always going to be at 11.59 p.m., uh, I'll accept it. But please don't abuse that. Please don't abuse that. Get your work in on time. If you're trying to submit something at midnight, then you know you really should have your stuff a little better together than that. So get your stuff on time. Get it in. I know you know things go down. Canvas goes down. I understand it. So, but as long as it's within that 24 hour period, that 24 hour grace period is there only for assignments. It's not there for exams. There's no grace period on the exams. You've got to get the exams in the time period that the exams are made. Okay, so finally, I shouldn't have to do this, but of course, uh, we always have to make some kind of statement about academic honesty. Uh, hopefully you know what plagiarism is. Hopefully you know about not copying others' works. Uh, also, uh, anyone caught cheating or uh, committing an act of plagiarism, uh, could be reported. They'll receive a, a failing grade for that assignment and they may receive a failing grade for the course. Uh, for more information, please look at the uh, University uh, Student Handbook on this. Uh, for class citizenship and participation, uh, recognize there's no face-to-face -face meetings, so the video lectures will be dropped uh, onto Canvas, so take a look at them. And so people say, well, how can I part show my participation? Well, turn your assignments in on time. Uh, and contribute to the discussions. There are graded discussions of every one of these lectures. You don't have to make a long comment, just a short comment or two um, to you know respond. I'll have discussion prompts, you'll respond to those, and hopefully that'll help. Make sure you read the assignments, watch the videos in a timely fashion. Again, there is a course schedule that lets you know when you should be watching these classes, but if you miss one or two, you can catch up. It's really on your own self-discipline, but don't wait too long. Don't be trying to cram in all the lectures um, the week of the midterm is due because that will get you into trouble. And so finally, uh, Canvas and online tools. So everything is posted on Canvas. All of your information is Canvas. So watch Canvas. This is very important. This is your lifeline. Why don't we just go now to why don't we just go to canvas and just show you some of these features so when you go to canvas everything is organized in modules so you have all of these different pages that you should have read through but when you go to a course introduction for example the course introduction will have a video uh, it doesn't yet have this video here because i'm recording it now <laughs> there it is so there is uh, the history of arts renaissance that's the first part of this video uh, notice that I have a link that will actually take you to a copy of the PowerPoint so you can follow along with the PowerPoint. Uh, if you want to see the guidelines, if you go down here to the research paper or project proposal, uh, you'll notice that if you click here, this will take you to a page that has the guidelines for everything. You can download the guidelines for either the paper proposal or the project proposal. So all information is here and all uh, things are interactions are through here. I've already showed you the textbook. Uh, all of the lectures are up there. You should be able to get access to them. So watch Canvas. Uh, the discussions, uh, watch them. That's how you're going to you know, communicate and interact with this class. And finally, just some last advice. Uh, the biggest thing about this class is the thing that causes students to fail is that they ghost the class. So I'm saying don't ghost the class. Read the syllabus, read the assignments, check Canvas, check the announcements, check the discussions, the alignments, uh, the assignments, the deadlines, and, and show up. And you know, we don't have a face-to-face -face class, but you can still manage your time, you can still take notes, and you can still ask questions. The biggest thing is don't wait to get help. I'm not an ogre. You can approach me. I'm happy to help people. I want everyone to succeed in this class. So uh, come to me if you run into any problems. Certainly if you run into any technical problems, shoot me an email or a Canvas message. Uh, and if you have any questions, if there are questions about 
content in the lectures, ask them in the lecture uh, discussions. That's a great way to make a comment and show your participation. The other way to do it is to you know shoot me an email if it's something generally, uh, because if you ghost the class, you're going to wind up in trouble. Okay, so that's the course. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to it. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Uh, almost all the material is up. Uh, I feel like I'm launching you out of the nest and saying, fly, fly, be free. Uh, but I hope you will uh, come back to visit because I'm so lonely in my basement. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.